Okay, everyone, um, we are now live at this um, seminar. Um, just to say, um, we have enabled um, interpretation for this, uh, so French and English. So if you need to hear the um, seminar in French, just click the globe icon at the bottom called interpretation, and you can listen to watch channel, um, the French or English channel as well. If you don't need to listen to any, to any interpretation, you don't need to do anything. But just to say, there's the interpretation globe at the bottom where you can pick um, the French or English channel. So, yeah, away to you, Jean. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming for this seminar on healing justice as a radical approach to African feminist organizing. Um, as a way of the background, you know, we are currently at a pivotal moment as the world where we are reeling from the impact of crisis after crisis, multiple and intersecting crisis. Uh, most recent, of course, in our memory is COVID and its impact. It really deepened the fault lines of injustice that determine who thrives and who suffers in the world. And it brought those to the fore because those fault lines you know, exist already. Uh, but coupled with that, of course, um, since COVID, we've seen increased militarization, I mean, there's the armed conflict and aggression all over the world. You can pick Russia's invasion of Ukraine as the most prevalent. However, we have existential armed conflict in Africa, mostly triggered by crises in democracy. And this really impacts civic space and the uh, well being and activism of activists and women human rights defenders in, in the context. We have heightened cultural and religious fundamentalisms that manifest in diverse ways, uh, including jeopardizing the identities of many um, activists and defenders and women who are non-binary uh, and women and communities that are non-binary uh, and uh, gender non-conforming. Uh, we also have uh, macroeconomic models, um, macroeconomic development models that are actually rooted in racialized capitalism, neoliberal, uh, policies which are further entrenching economic deprivation at macro level and micro level and that impacts uh, defenders and activists and activism in different uh, ways. Uh, of course, overarching to that is the global climate crisis that is spiraling natural disaster and food insecurity. With this context, context in mind, uh, it may be surprising um, that we're having all these contexts one after the other, but it should not be surprising to us. These conflicts are inbuilt. I mean, these crises, as they happen one after another, they are inbuilt into the way that our society is structured. Uh, we are structured with the fault lines that I mentioned, and those fault lines um, mean that we have a systemic oppression and structural violence and a whole range of communities that are pushed to the margins of society and suffer at the, at the expense of other few communities that are thriving as they continue exploiting body activity and mind uh, of those communities. This is a critical moment in time right now. And it's a time for us as activists, as defenders, as development practitioners to call for business unusual, to do things differently, to transform the way we are engaging uh, in order to foster resilience and resistance that is needed to counter all the crises and the pushback that's coming um, 
to oppress further marginalized communities. It's a time to call for strategies that are based on a combination of unpacking systemic oppression and structural violence, and packing that, raising critical consciousness, understanding intergenerational and current trauma, and the harm that it causes activists, human rights defenders, and the threat that it presents to sustaining um, activism. Secondly, based on that critical consciousness, it is a time to transform the organizing that we do and the activism and strategies that we engage for activism by centering collective healing practices and transforming organizational structures and providing different and nuanced support to movements and activists, looking at movements and movement building, not just as tools and tactics, but centering the people that are doing actually the movements and movement building and the activism. Um, so our orientation to healing justice is a partnership between Agent Action Fund Africa, which is a Pan-African feminist fund, uh, providing rapid response mechanism to support African women human rights defenders to sustain themselves and their activisms uh, advancing women's human rights in Africa. Uh, in partnership with the Institute of Development Studies, we've worked over the past couple of years to interrogate what healing justice means as a political organizing framework, and in particular, its applicability to activists and defenders in, Af in Africa, given you know, the roots of healing justice organizing based in North Africa in queer and black, uh, com black and indigenous communities. Um, today, we are sharing the findings of this research and the emergent framework we have as a range of speakers uh, will speak about that. This is um, coming out of around 40 to 50 interviews with women human rights defenders across the continent and some in the diaspora uh, that then led us to engage in a deep analysis to present a framework um, for transforming and centering collective care and healing uh, as part of radical approaches to movement building. Uh, before we go into the discussions, we have a whole range of speakers and we'll introduce all those speakers. They were involved in the research in different ways and will speak to the role that they had in the research. I would like to end with some acknowledgements. I'll begin with acknowledging the Executive Director of Agent Action Fund Africa, Dana Bofutawamba, who led the initial thought processes in 2017 of incorporating healing justice as an activist, um, a radical movement building strategy. This was as a result of trends analysis from the grants that we were giving as a fund where we noticed the increased attack on defenders and the increased challenges of burnout and vicarious trauma um, that then were impacting on the activism of the work, given the grants that we're receiving and the engagements that we were having with our partners. Uh, I would also like to thank especially the researchers from the DRC, Nigeria, Senegal, and South Africa, and they are here, and some of them will be speaking, they will be introduced, but our Stella, Olga, uh, Danai, and your teams, thank you so, so, so much for the role that you have played in this uh, research. I would like to thank the staff of Urgent Action Fund Africa for, you know, giving it your all, even if it wasn't your um, some of you, it was not exactly the core of your work, but I'd like to thank you all. I especially would like to thank the Feminist Republic team as well, Melissa Wainaina, Ablavi Goku, and Zanele, um, for the work that you did uh, carrying the piece of the Feminist Republic work and the healing justice research. Uh, thanking Tessa Lewin too, who is a part of the investigative teams, part of the researchers, and she's um, with IDS as well. And of course, Jackie Shaw from IDS and Masa Amir from UF Africa, who did the heavy lifting of this research project. I would like to thank our funders too. I'm not going to name each and every one of them, but they know who they are and like to thank them for funding this work, especially when it is in difficult uh, to find funders that can fund healing work, collective care, uh, and centering care as a movement building strategy. 
So now we are going to move on to the research uh, process. Uh, Jackie will take us through the research process. But before she starts, I'd like to say just a bit about who Jackie is, so you know who's speaking to us. She's a social psychologist with key expertise in the use of visual and performance methods to drive and mediate participatory action research, community development, and social change processes. She's currently a research fellow in the Participation, Inclusion, and Social Change Cluster and IDS Research Ethics Convener. She has over 30 years in a diverse range of community, international development and health contexts, and she's an experienced participatory facilitator, consultant, project leader, senior lecturer, and multidisciplinary researcher. Over to you, Jackie. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much, Jean, for introducing uh, us all. And I'm going to now move to introducing the research process in brief. So we can um, share the slides, Sonali, starting at slide four. So basically, we started from the assumption that healing justice should be contextualized to context. Um, it's an emerging, exciting new forms of organizing, but we wanted to, guided by these two research questions, explore and understand what healing justice means to feminist activists in different African contexts, from a political rather than a medical standpoint, and also to get their perspective on what collective healing process might involve and how they could evolve and be supported as an approach to feminist organizing. So after a preliminary review on communal and feminist healing practices, we can go to the next slide. Three case countries were chosen for the interview phase um, to encompass some diversity. The DRC was chosen as it has a high pre prevalence of sexual violence used as a weapon of war. Senegal as a predominantly Muslim country with a rise in anti-queer discourse from religious leaders and others and South Africa for its high levels of gender-based violence alongside increasing political discourse about and application of healing justice practices. As Jean said, a research team was recruited in each country and each team conducted virtual interviews. Um, we would have preferred to do in-person interviews, but um, this research was carried out during the pandemic. And there were three categories of interview participant. Um, the first was um, women human rights defenders or feminist activists, some who have already experienced collective healing processes and some not. Uh, there were traditional and holistic healers of practices relevant to feminist contexts, and also some academics with knowledge of relevant transformative and feminist approaches. Um, the, the teams were key in recruiting the participants, and we also extend our thanks to all those um, activists and healers who shared their experiences and knowledge with us um, and their wisdom without which we couldn't have done this research. So as Jean said, there were 47 interviews in total, about 12 in each focus country, and these were supplemented for greater diversity by 13 regional interviews, uh, which were conducted by Stella Odiasi, um, with participants in other countries in East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, North Africa. Out of 47 participants, 15% were both um, feminist activists and healers. Um, there was some init initial it it analysis, our analysis process was, was iterative, and after this there were two learning events organized, each of four um, sessions, um, and the external event involved African um, feminist activists from 11 African countries, um, including academics, feminist historians, activists, medical doctors, therapists, and healers who were already active in healing justice spaces. So the next slide, please. Um, there are two publications from this research so far, and we cannot today do justice to all of the insights in them. Um, but we hope today to give you a flavour of what we learnt and what's to come. So we can come out of the slides now. We're going to go over to Massa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, we'll go over to you, Massa. Uh, before we go to Massa, I'd like to introduce uh, Massa so you can all know her. Massa is my colleague. 
at Agent Action Fund Africa. She works as the knowledge leadership manager. She's an Egyptian feminist and currently uh, working at the fund. She has extensive experience in research and documentation of the experiences of women human rights defenders across Africa. She's passionate about exploring protection and collective security and care needs of defenders and the centrality of healing to feminist movement building. Over to you, Marcy. Thanks, Jean. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. And it's really great to see a lot of familiar names saying hi in the chat box. Um, all right. So, um, so, um, did, okay. Yeah, that's the slide. <laughs> great. Um, great. So, so two, um, overarching themes or branches emerged from um, the interviews with women's human rights defenders and healers. Um, the first branch is understanding and addressing the causes and impacts of the injustice and harm that African women human rights defenders experience and grapple with. And the second branch is changing the nature and practices of feminist organizing and movement building work. I will briefly take you through branch one um, on understanding and addressing the causes and impacts of the injustices and harm. And I will start with the focus on exploring the root causes of trauma and violence. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, so two um, main um, the branches emerged here as the root causes of trauma and violence. The first is um, structural violence, and that entailed a feminist analysis of the structural violence that is at the heart of the trauma, distress, and depression that women's human rights victims experience. And the second is um, transgenerational and collective trauma. Um, I'll start with. Starting with structural violence, we can move on to the, to the next slide. So the term describes the ways in which social structures are designed to stop certain individuals and groups from reaching their full potential. This is not this is a kind of violence that is not readily observable um, because it's embedded in long-standing social structures, it's normalized by institutions, by regular experiences, and it becomes the ordinary way in which we experience the world. <laughs> so much so that it is normalized and any thought of anything that opposes this, um, these kinds of social structures um, is, is made to uh, feel and look like stepping out of the out of the norm and is usually faced with severe backlash. I'm really sorry, I'm getting a cold, I think. I'm so sorry. Um, and the research goes into exploring structural violence as it's experienced by women's human rights defenders in healthcare, economic, and criminal justice systems. And the roots of these systems and various um, structures including capitalism, colonialism, ableism, heteronormativity, among other um, systems of oppression. Um, but due to time limitations, I'll just provide an example of the structural violence of healthcare institutions. We can move on to the next slide. So different manifestations of um, violence of healthcare institutions is um, um, or are discussed in the report. One manifestation is the denial of access to affordable, culturally specific, and anti oppressive healthcare as one of the root causes of trauma. Um, healthcare is barely culturally specific, and that is given decades of. Uh, the erasure of traditional health practices with the onset of colonialism, the introduction of hospital-based medicine, and the ways in which a dichotomy between body and soul were entrenched. 
um, the research illustrates that this duality was not a feature of traditional understandings of health and illness, which focused on aligning imbalances in bodily systems with aspects of larger social and ecological systems. Um, the research traces the manner in which health was medicalized under colonialism, becoming a technical issue rather than a social institution that has cultural, social, and economic consequences. And um, the legacy of colonialism continues, and it manifests in the, the way in which the experiences of women's human rights defenders continues to be pathologized. Um, and the, you know, the psychiatric hospital-based model influences funding support that is available to women's human rights defenders and feminist activists um, and the ways in which well-being and care support are framed. And so this model prescribes support that is largely individualized um, it translates into individual counseling, relocation, other individual focused practices that, although are certainly useful, and uh, the research does not argue that these practices should be um, halted or opposed in any way, but alone, they, they do not take into account the social, political, and economic roots of distress. And one quote that sums up the awareness that a lot of activists expressed in interviews towards the sole medical model is this quote by a South African activist who said that people have gone into, into treatment and yet we are all so sick. We are sick spiritually. We are not healing and we are not healed. Hmm. Activists spoke a feeling that something is missing from well-being and care support. Um, as classic approaches to mental and physical health alone are not supporting them to grapple with the collective trauma and is not really created to address the political roots of unwellness. The sole focus on a medical lens to explain human experiences with unwellness has also paved the way for an oppressive lens of what constitutes healthy bodies, um, which combined with the hegemon, hegemon patriarchy, capitalism, ableism, has meant that this healthy body is largely male, able-bodied, and heterosexual. And a clear example of this, of this oppressive application of the notion of a healthy body uh, pertains to, to the experiences of women's human rights defenders with disabilities, as disability has been normatively understood through the lens of medicalization. And so activists with disabilities describe discriminatory practices and beliefs by institutions of healthcare that are built on the assumption that their bodies are um, somehow a, de a deviation from normal, quote unquote, normal bodies. And heteronormativity is a fundamental value and framework in this case. And it really plays a, a really prominent role in um, what a healthy body is. And it informs notions about pure versus sinful bodies, which are deeply embedded um, in the concepts of a healthy body. And so a sinful, sinful bodies are illustrated as victors of disease. And these are the bodies of sex workers, of LGBTQI individuals who are engaged in um, sexually quote unquote deviant practices. And the medical policing of these bodies is also um, explored in the research um, and the ways in which it emanates from the seemingly neutral interest of maintaining public health, which necessarily means state intervention and policing. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. Um, and so this is just one um, one um, example, a brief one of one um, um, structure of oppression that is explored in the research. Um, and then the second um, the second root of 
or cause of trauma and violence is transgenerational and collective trauma, which refers to the collective sharing of an experience of trauma, such as sharing the experience of state or communal violence against the community or structural stressors that impact the physical, mental, and emotional health of a group. And the central idea here is that the impacts go beyond the individual <laughs> to having broad social and political consequences. And their research explores both the roots and also the manifestations of collective trauma. Um, I'll go over one example in each category, also due to time limitations. But one of the roots of collective trauma is living under unrelenting threat and violence. So activists here spoke of the realities of their context and the characteristics of these contexts that have really um, held for generations as a source of constant trauma. And that includes deeply rooted homophobia, transphobia, militarization, hyper-nationalism, um, family violence, um, the continuously evolving ways in which um, women's human rights defenders are criminalized, um, the characteristics of what really is often dubbed the closure of civic space are a, um, a source of collective and transgenerational trauma. And the, the, the research explores the ways in which this trauma manifests in activist spaces in, in different ways. Um, one manifestation um, was feeling born with a wound, which was a quote from um, from um, an interview. Um, and, it and that was reflected in several interviews of second generation activists um, whose parents were active in anti-apartheid struggles. So one activist explained that exploring the histories of her family traumas um, was critical to her own understanding of why, quote, her body and soul feel heavy and why she constantly feels traumatized. And so making the connection between her feelings and the historical traumas that her parents endured as part of a generation that was active in that struggle was critical to her healing. And so the research makes the point that trauma is not an individual experience or an isolated incident, but it's a transgenerational experience that manifests in different ways, in our collective psyche and memory. And it is with this awareness that we can begin to make sense of what may have felt like fragmented pieces of our collective story. The research then explores um, what it would look like if we create activism spaces that are informed by this awareness of the roots of our collective and transgenerational trauma and distress. And um, and that so that is the second branch um, of the uh, image that I started with. And to take us through that, I will hand over to Jackie or to Dean. Sure. All right. Um. Thank you, Massa. I see questions already forming. I see comments. Um. To people in the audience, if you would like to post your questions, post them in the Q and A dialogue chat comments um, so that then we can ensure that you will have enough, uh, your questions will be answered because we are going to have time with the panel uh, for a Q&A soon after Jackie speaks. Masa has laid out the foundation for us on structural violence, intergenerational and collective trauma, and how that manifests systemically, institutionally to us to impact at the personal and interpersonal level and also at the organizing level. We'll go to Jackie, who will then lead us through the second tranche of the healing justice framework that was um, advanced around transforming um, feminist activism, transforming movement building uh, by centering uh, collective healing practices. Uh, over to you, Jackie. Okay, thank you, Zanelli. We can go to slide 14. So as Massa has highlighted, uh, feminist activists experience harm because of both who they are and what they do in defending rights. And in the research, we found that lived experiences of injustice and trauma often motivates activism. Within this, the, key, the theme of common souls in trauma emerged, particularly in Senegal, which encompassed 
the positive experiences that come from sharing experiences, bonding and acting together. But many interviewees also had continuous traumatic stress due to unaddressed collective trauma from their past and pre present injustices that they'd experienced. And as Massa said, this manifests within feminist organizations in ongoing impacts for individual bodies, individual women, in terms of the sustained anger, grief, fear, burnout, and re-traumatization, and in the social bodies of move feminist movements, such as the cultures of activism that value overwork for the cause and the toxic uh, activist relationships that can develop um, in, in, in this way when feminist movements can, can generate vicious cycles of trauma amplification, which is shown in the diagram on the right. And this highlights the importance of prioritizing collective care and healing practices as movement work, which is encompassed by the second branch of our healing justice framework. Can we go to the next slide, please? So Max has covered slide, uh, branch one of the healing justice framework um, that has been uh, is, is emerging in a sense. And this is a call to action, really. The second branch of the healing justice framework points forward towards the intention to change the nature and practices of feminist organizing. Healing justice is anticipated to build on the energizing aspects of activism, but also address the consequences of injustice, both within activists and the movements by engaging differently in movement work to enable collective healing. And today I will touch on two aspects that are shown in this diagram, um, transforming culture, spaces and relations of activism, and also incorporating collective healing processes as a central part of social justice feminist organizing. Can we go to the next slide? So through an iterative process back and forth between our data and prior literature, we identified four conceptual pillars as theoretical foundation for the healing justice intentions. So in summary, uh, healing justice is political. We grounded this orientation in relationship to literature on African transformative feminism. For example, the need to address what has been termed the ghosts of historical injustice, and the idea that this is about working for something better, not merely holding women safe or helping them cope. And as inequitous power dynamics often determine how structural violence and collective trauma are perpetuated in activist lives through micro level relations, this we believe must be tackled with intersectional awareness. Second, our interview participants confirmed that healing justice requires a collective orientation to heal collective trauma. This means it's anticipated to go beyond individual healing or caring group contexts. This is apart from the reality that individualized treatments are costly and time dependent and thus inaccessible for many activists who are living in poverty. It's also because medicalized and individual treatments don't heal the impacts of collective tra trauma, either for individuals or in the social sicknesses that can be reflected in wider society and in movements. And, and, and also in terms of being individual, um, treatment holds respons women responsible for systemic problems. So incorporating collective healing as movement work is seen as a radical form of feminist political action because it aims to tackle historic and collective trauma through healing the manifestations from within. How relational dynamics and inter interactional processes are facilitated in healing spaces across difference was highlighted as a tension uh, and a key aspect of generating inclusive healing spaces. But many interview participants identified not knowing how to navigate these tensions between interests and have the difficult conversations that may be needed. Our third conceptual pillar is holistic healing towards wholeness. And this responds to the embodied nature of trauma. Um, often holistic healing is needed to address the disconnection between body, mind, emotion, and spiritual effects, and also unfold processes towards social healing and political healing, um, from the personal to the political, as the feminist adage goes. 
So African healing traditions can ground a wider perspective on wholeness or holistic healing. At the individual level, body, mind, spirit are seen as connected, but additionally, harmonious relationships or disharmony between the universe, environment, community, family, peers, ancestors, natural spirits and deities are viewed as the roots of well-being or distress. And we also use the theory of the three bodies, which connects the body self, social bodies, including nature, culture and society, and the body politic, which controls or influences social bodies. Um, and th this also helpfully grounds healing justice's intention to move beyond tackling individual trauma within groups to collectively bring, build critical awareness of the social and political systems behind oppression. We also reference liberation psychology practices, which are broadly uh, two types, communicative, verbal and analytical, such as critical dialogue and narrative methods, or more embodied practices such as creative, artistic, or performing uh, methods, which, of which there are many examples practiced in different African contexts. The final conceptual pillar points to the need for critical understanding of the pathways towards individual, social, and political healing beyond idealism. Um, our assumption is that collective healing is complex, multidimensional, and a layered process that needs time to iteratively progress depending on the people involved. And I, I propose it, it will necessarily involve negotiating inherent tensions in doing this. And due to the entrenched nature of collective trauma, healing justice processes need to have long, long temporal scales. There needs to be time both because practices aim to connect the past to the present to build future possibilities, and because progressive sequence led or ongoing activities are likely required. Can we go to the next slide, please? We therefore assume from the beginning that the healing needs and journeys of each feminist activist and movement will be unique. And this is not about an instrumental approach, practices must be combined adaptively uh, according to the situation. However, our research identified some common foundational healing elements that could be drawn on in creating pathways forward. So can we go to the next slide? So creating spaces for emotional processing in collective context or working towards what activists termed emotional justice was a strongly it expressed desire from healing justice for many of the interview participants. And in terms of what might be done within groups, there were two activity strands. There were what we term verbal, interactive, or analytical practices. At first, storytelling practices were, were very present within the data, whether women's circles or story work or just sharing experiences. But sharing personal stories within a group, uh, including themes like the right to be heard and not judge, breaking unbearable silence, naming feelings and being heard was important. Though there are clearly risks in that, this, and this is why it can't be a, a short term one off sort of thing, um, but many of the part participants believe that it's being heard and witnessed that can begin a healing journey. However, this would might be anticipated to be combined with um, critical dialogue or feminist consciousness raising. So often after sharing stories, group members uh, were, were talking about identifying parallels in their stories and asking, so what? Critically interrogating the social and political systems to make sense of how and why things are this way. There were also embodied, what we called embodied symbolic and enacted practices, which are really important in terms of trauma because trauma often, um, the effects of trauma and trauma memories are embodied. Uh, they're, they're stored in part of the brain that bypasses the more rational um, thinking part of the brain. And um, to, to remember them, bring them to the surface, um, embodied methods um, are often suggested. So one example is collective rhythmic activity, such as communal dancing, drumming, and song, which can shift these embodied effects 
also stillness and space to breathe, connecting with nature, things that were more relaxing, walking, talking, being together were also uh, mentioned. Another embodied aspect of um, practice is spiritual work, what we would term spiritual work. Um, religious and ritual practices were common, from communal prayer, prayer to traditional healing rituals, um, particularly came up in Senegal. And working with spirits and ancestors particularly came up in South Africa, where participants, many participants, frame the healing of the impacts of intergenerational trauma as a spiritual task. Colonialism has resulted in the systemic erasure of traditional healing practices, and so rekindling them as part of healing justice is a form of feminist resistance. However, participants identified the importance of feminist interrogation of the suitability of traditional practices to feminist contexts and the consequent need in, in many cases for adaption. Our research also suggested that due to the nature of trauma, the interweaving back and forth between verbal and analytical and embodied practices might be most effective. An example is body mapping, which is, was developed substantially in South Africa. After creating their own body maps to access embodied knowledge, each person speaks about what's shown and if facilitated with intention, this can prop discussion of learnings in relationship to history, politics and power. Uh, one of our participants had also used a similar approach in combining dance healing followed by group discussion. So can we go to the next slide, please? So healing justice is intended to involve making connections between personal experiences, organizing relations and the wider socio-political environmental influences. Our research suggested that pathways to rebuilding activist communities, social he healing and transforming the body politic could begin with social healing within movements, incorporating a combination of an activities intending to rekindle radical hope as lack of hope is a barrier to change, reframe activist narratives after analyzing the structural roots of trauma and injustice and build inclusive solidarity across difference. We identified practices that could assist, such as future visioning and transformative storytelling, but there are many more. Incorporating narrative, visual and performative methodologies to create outputs could contribute to working for visibility and acceptance, which was identified as a desired healing justice outcome by queer activists and sex workers in Senegal or lead to other external collective actions, protests, performing influence, public rituals, and, and practical support, which were all identified as sustaining healing by some participants. And of course, this is not a linear process. For many, healing might start with being involved in protests and, and later moving into collective healing spaces. At the same time, we're not um, overly celebratory or idealistic about these processes. During the research, we also learned about and are mindful of the tensions that will need to be navigated in making collective healing pathways from the personal to political a reality. Um, we also learned about the changes needed in organizational structuring and funding. And I think Ablavi will touch on that later. Um, in our output so far, our uh, very top level in many ways, although there are many insights within them, um, and what we hope to go on to is produce more nuanced <laughs> insights, and Ol Olga and I will con consider some of the more nuanced insights about the particular context later, um, which we were maybe unable to do justice to in our first research output. In many ways, we're at the beginning of learning on how collective healing pathways could be supported in specific African contexts. And personally, I'd like to see more research using participatory action research methodologies to enable greater understanding of what works and what doesn't in practice in particular contexts. So we can stop the slide now. Um, that's, that's from me and I'm going to pass back to Jean.
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Masa. Um, colleagues, participants, you've had the technical aspects of the analysis of the research, the framework that has been advanced from the research questions and from discussing with defenders and activists across the context, um, the structure of violence, intergenerational and collective trauma, and how those manifest uh, to affect interpersonal personal and organizing culture and activities uh, and threaten you know the very movements that we have to advance social justice you've also heard from jackie around what then can be done if that's the uh, situation um the four conceptual pillars of um, centering healing healing justice uh, healing as politicized a transformation not a going back to healing as collective process, healing as holistic and embracing wholeness, and healing as processio, a non-linear process. She has also uh, outlined pathways and activities uh, that could be engaged or tip, a typology of activities that could be engaged uh, to center healing and healing justice and to also transform uh, feminist organizing and feminist spaces. It's now over to you um, for questions, comments. We wanted to check, take a break at this point, not a break, but a stop, and to hear from you as the participants. What resonates? What questions do you still have? What do you know differently? Um, what light bulbs are going off as you hear what's being spoken about? on what could be done and any other questions and comments that you have. Uh, we are monitoring the chat. We are also monitoring the Q&A dialogue. Please post your questions. If you wish, you can post them in the chat. If you see and can access the Q&A dialogue box, please uh, type your questions there. So far, we have um, three questions, um, one from Leila, and I'll read them out and have the panelists, you know, uh, Jackie and Massa respond to this as the rest of you continue posting uh, comments and questions that you may that you may have. So the first one from Leila, she's interested in knowing, and hi Leila, uh, she's interested in knowing how we incorporated care into the research process, given the subject matter was heavy. How were your research processes trauma informed? A uh, very interesting and good question, Leila. Uh, Isa too, sir. Should would more research is asking? Would more research dedicated to the development of a survivor-centered, culturally competent and spiritually responsive healing approach for women suffice? So this is a call for more research. Um, but you know, I think she would like also. They would like to know your thoughts on would more research dedicated to the development of a survivor-centered, culturally competent and spiritually responsive healing approach for women uh, work, or what do you think about that? And then there's a comment on healing justice is to organizations, what social justice is to movements. We walk in two spaces with a world and a history behind us exactly, totally. That's the point that we are making. And we need to acknowledge that. A lack of acknowledgement creates conflicts within the individual spirit and soul of organizations, and if I may add, of persons, of relations, and threatens the very existence of movements. But so that those are the th two questions and one comment uh, over to you right now, um, Masa and Jackie. As the rest of you, please um, continue posting your comments and questions before we move on to the in-depth uh, look at country nuances from Olga and Danai. Over to you, um, Masa, then we'll go to you, Jackie. And we can hear from maybe da from Danai and Olga if they have anything to add to this as well, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I think okay. I saw a question on the difference between Restorative justice and healing justice. Question is: Is restorative justice the same as healing justice? Uh, right. 
All right, so let's add that to the question pool that we have, the difference between transformative justice, I mean, <clears throat> justice and healing justice. Um, Maybe you can start with yeah. that one, Nasa. Yeah, yeah, I think that one. Um, so, so restorative justice, um, in, 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 in my understanding, focuses on, um, focuses on bringing victims and perpetrators of harm um, um, together. And the focus is on accountability, is on forgiveness and healing and restoring relationships basically to what they were before the harm, before the harm was done. Um, I would say that healing justice takes, um, takes it a step further and argues that restoring to what to um to 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 kind of the condition or the situation before the before the harm was done is not sufficient and critique that like idealized before um and makes the case that the before is actually um was actually um characterized by a lot of systemic violence and inequality that created the relationships and gave perpetrators the power to um to commit these harms and so it critiques that idealized before and instead argues for um kind of a transformative transformative reality that um where this harm and and that kind of power would not exist in the first place i would say that is my that is my Kind of understanding or take on the difference between restorative versus healing justice. Um, and um, there was also a question on how we centered care in the research process. And we, of course, that so so the, the interviews were really heavy and um and activists really, really shared very raw personal and family experiences and history. Um, and so we we really tried to 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 um to provide a kind of um emotional and mental support um to activists um um after the after the interviews if if that is needed <laughs> with the kind of healers and um, practitioners who have a feminist political understanding of, of trauma and violence. Um, and um, we also shared that um, UAF Africa is, 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 is keen on supporting activists and groups in um, kind of experimenting with this framework. So if that leads to, because there were interviews where activists spoke of um, traditional practices that they believe could be applied to feminist settings, but um, of that application needs to, it needs feminist critique as well. Um, and that these kinds of resources and understandings from funders or donors are, um, are missing. Um, and so one thing that we also um, we also stressed before, you know, during after the interviews, is that we are going to provide that kind of support to kind of have this collective exploration of what that might look like. And of course, that support was also um, was also um, available to the to to the researchers who carried out these very heavy. Um, interviews. So these were some of the ways in which we um, tried to center care in the research process. Um, yeah, I'll hand it over to you and to, to everyone else. Yeah, over to you, Jackie, and then we'll hear from you, Olga and Danai. Okay, so um, Leila's question, how you incorporated care into the research process. Um, so um, obviously, we're dealing with um, research that is exploring 
difficult experiences. So um, thinking about support for women through that process was part of our ethics process. It was difficult in the pandemic context, we have to be honest, because the interviews were online. And I know that a lot of the researchers and a lot of the participants would have preferred that to be otherwise. Um, and But obviously, it was really important to keep everyone safe in the pandemic context. Um, we did change our interview process. So there were um, a stage process of engagement, not just the interview. So um, the researchers met online with the interviewees beforehand, um, talked about um, their needs, any accommodation needs, and 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 so on, and and went through the purpose and the consent process, and then participants went away to think about it before they decided whether to take part. And then there was the interview, and then researchers checked in afterwards with the interviews. Uh, we did um, create pathways for support, counselling support if needed for interviews afterwards. And in the learning events, we had um, counsellors present uh, to talk to women in a side room um, if needed, um, and, and in terms of checking in with people afterwards. So, so there was some thought about this, obviously. Um, we did have quite a lot of women using, using the counselling that was available. Um, certainly during the events, uh, maybe others can speak more about this, but I'm, I imagine Danai and Olga may have more to say about this but as part of the in-country research teams about how this worked in practice, because I know, the, you know, it was difficult during the pandemic context. Um, just looking at this uh, question about, um, would more research dedicated to the development of a survivor-centered culturally competent and spiritually responsive healing approach for women suffice? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure about this, um, whether this means is, is research enough, and you know, that's, that's a valid question. I mean, certainly um, the next stage, as far as I, I'm concerned, is, is about understanding what collective healing process, healing justice pathways might look like in specific contexts. But as I said before, I think that needs to happen through, through learning through action um, with mindful of the tensions and some of the, some of the data that has arisen already about the, the tensions that will need to be thought about in terms of um, culturally competent, if you like, um, healing, facilitation and so on, spaces that work and, and, and the extended timescales that I was talking about. Um, 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 the, uh, the other question I'd like to come to is Chloe's um, talking about her work with queer activists in Palestine and how anger emerged in this research. So anger certainly emerged very strongly in this research. Um, it was one of the um, what we defined as the ongoing impacts of injustice in for individuals and particularly the justified anger in struggling for many, many years and nothing changing. So anger, fear, um, other grief, other emotional effects were very pre present within the research. And, and this is why many of the participants thought um, support with um, collectively working through processing, enabling the expression of emotions was a really important part of the work. Um, because it was it was very obvious that anger in many cases turns inward and um, that leads to other physical um, effects. There were, there were um, feminist activists who attributed getting ill, ending up in hospital, um, due, being due to um, um, unexpressed, unacknowledged anger, undealt with anger. Um, and, and I think it's quite common in many activist contexts. So, so that's why processing of emotions, dealing with emotions was thought to be a really important part of this work. Um, so, and, and really what we found out a bit in terms of how the space was held for this safely is that that is part of what needs to be happened. So, as I said, that's the next stage of this 
research is putting this into practice. Again, Ablavi is going to talk a little bit more about what's happening next. Um, okay. So I'm just looking All right. at questions. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'll pass that to you. <laughs> so we move over to you, Danai, and then Olga, your thoughts. Um, there are questions um, that have been asked, but there are comments too. Um, there's a comment from Isaiah too around integrating healing justice uh, to, you know, organizations to know that survivors are at different stages of personal healing and healing is not a one size fits all, um, which was surfaced during the research. Um, to facilitate healing built into organization in phases by building trust, accountability, and integrity. Um, the difference between organizational trauma that is created by lack of funds, policies, or strategic direction, and organizational trauma that is created um, by leadership and staff, bringing their experience of trauma um, and GBV into the organizations. Uh, I said is also pointing out to survivors are among us, they are family members, our co-workers, and for us, you know, to be cognizant of this, and, and this really is what the research was about. And when we are talking about transforming spaces and pathways to healing, uh, that's where we are at. But, you know, comments and thoughts from you, Danai, and then Olga, um, around the questions and comments that have been raised in this section. Danai? Well, thank you. Um, I'll be really, really brief. The, the last comment, absolutely, and I think the insight from the South Africa research will maybe lead in the, that conversation about institutional processes. But I wanted to also say in terms of research process and a kind of ethics of care, um, whether it's related to method or the idea of who a self is, is recognizing that people participating um, across in different ways um, in terms of forms of prior kinship or relation connection was also part of I think, what enabled some the things that in normal research social science would be like uh, what words they use um rapport <laughs> for instance or in opening but I think there's because people hold multiple hyphens or multiple forms of identity and relation um, within re re like justice and feminist work um, that there were points of, and some of it was generational as pointed out. Um, and some of it is organizational and some of it is people move through different categories, whether healing practitioner or activist or academic or, so there were various kinds of positions some people held multiple of those and move between them. And I think that means that the nature of even how, even what the conditions of care or vulnerability could be engaged in contested, but also in other kinds of ways was um, a part of that process. And I wouldn't say resolved, particularly because we're speaking about processes that happen across various levels of hierarchy and structure, including processes of institutionalizing social movements. Um, and so I think in the last, the point you make about bringing people to a space where there are different stages of healing um, or different understandings within a cycle of structural and relational violence, complicity, contestation, and sometimes relation, connection, and comfort, that, that what that does is that it also is demanding for people to bring themselves in that kind of vulnerable way. And centering that conversation, I think, was also, because it wasn't like I, it centered, but it emerged continuously as another form of labor that, um, that becomes structural, relational, that needs similarly like other kinds of over labor and over time that activists are doing is in now assembled together. It's not an additional, but it's a part of an assemblage of something continuous and circular and yeah. All right, thank you so much. Olga, any comments just before you come on to share insights from DRC? Any comments on the questions that were asked, the comments that have been made? And colleagues, Olga will be speaking in French, so you'll want to follow Gary's instructions and click the globe and click the language. Olga?
Olga, you're muted. Mm, could someone check the translation, please? I hear the French version. So Gary's just checking it. Hmm. All right. Let's give that one minute to check. Um, and then if it doesn't work, we can move to Danai to start her insights as Gary and the team check the translation piece. Just, uh, we're just giving that a few Olga seconds. Olga is muted. Olga needs, can one of the translators ask Olga to unmute herself because she may not realize she's muted and maybe put her camera on. Okay. All right. So as we work that technicality out, um, let's move to the next section. And when Olga, when we're able to get Olga, she will both talk to the questions, her insights on the questions, but also share the nuances um, within the context. Now we, we had the technical aspects of the research, the framework, but now we want to go in depth in uh, because the research countries were three and want to go in depth and explore nuances uh, from different countries. We'll start now with Danai, who will share with us nuances within South Africa. And she'll also share with us um, the issue of language because language is political as we all know. We're using the wording, appealing justice. It's a concept um, being framed in English. We're working in the African context uh, where healing justice is practiced, but may be um, used in, uh, phrased and framed in different ways. So Danai, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of African Literature at the University of Wits, uh, specializes in gender and sexualities, black intellectual traditions and histories, intimacy and how those affect feminist pedagogies. She's a member of the editorial collective of Agenda Feminist Media and recently co-edited the Agenda Specialist issue on COVID-19, the intimacies of pandemics in 2021 and has edited several other volumes, including a special issue of GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies titled Time Out of Joint, the Queer and Customary in Africa uh, with Neville Hood at Kirk Frederick. Over to you, Danai. Thanks. I think biography is a very strange genre. <laughs> Claim it cringe. and own it. Cringe. Um, <laughs> um, I think the slides are the slides can go up um and the decision there were many interesting um things to note um observe what came up in this research um and focusing on the idea of the political um emerged partly in the context of time and space i'm in within a university where we are highly securitized and um <laughs> and i'm like and the subject various subjects of what it means to enter politics um as discussed um often emerge from the context of the environment one is in how one comes in contact with a sense of their identity as a political one but also that process of consciousness um has sort of two effects in some ways partly because it it comes up due to the experience the kind of routine experience of structural and relational violence at multiple levels um what forms that make trauma that but also that in coming to that awareness that also it it, it and allows a kind of vocabulary to why things are happening but it also even in making connection with others in identifying um, a shared experience or consciousness of that experience, that it also creates an environment, a weather itself of, of, of that is in a cycle of trauma. And also then thinking, and I talked about multiple hyphens, people may occupy different categories of their political identity. So as a feminist or as a student or as a worker or as 
And so that each of them are embedded in their own histories and their own idioms, their own languages and their own habits. And in part, what they then do or allow, so if people can move through those different positions of political action and its practice and its idioms, sometimes people who occupy many may be easily code switching. Sometimes there are kind of confines about what it enables or allows. And, and so this then leaks into, um, I guess, what kind of vocabulary people have to think about political action as it relates also to how trauma manifests. Um, and that's a movement partly because they are begin with um, those moments, those kind of layering moments of a consciousness and awareness of where and how power operates, what, what histories we have to generate from or continue existing hierarchies that are also within social movements, including who carries authority and who doesn't, or who has social capital and who doesn't, or who has whatever kinds of resources and who doesn't, which are impacted onto then a cycle of trauma that is within social movements, but then is, I think, also then amplified in the process of institutionalizing social movements. Um, often the requirement to sustain even the, the capacity to continue requires resources, requires support, requires the support of various kinds of resource persons. And like I say, many hyphens, so one can move from activist to scholar, to healing practitioner, to student, to worker, borrowing from those idioms, but also that that necessity is about resource generation, but it does, again, reproduce within the institutional process itself, hierarchies that exist in the world. And so that process, while potentially necessary to sustain things, um, we see organizations collapsing um, precisely because the nation between the institutional process, existing hierarchies, what's able to be spoken and not spoken, and, um, and the habits that accumulate, whether it's secrecy or it's like masking conversation <laughs> or it's simply accepting or conceding to it or being completely burnt out because there's no sense of time. And I think a lot of activists who, because in, in those processes, some people become employed, some people are not employed, they're volunteers. And the term activist itself has this virtue to it, but it doesn't engage with the one who's a volunteer, who has no food, no money, no resources, no transport, who's made unsafe. And then the labor between those who have employment and those without employment also creates not only an implicit and explicit hierarchy, but also labors. The number of times I had to reschedule interviews with someone because it's 11 o'clock at night and they're still working, partly because they're laboring those gaps um, out of a intentional <laughs> conscientiousness to it or doing the debriefing work. Um, literally, I just, like, I'm coming from class on a conversation about about that really became about loss, but I was like, you need to sit and debrief um, simply in the classroom experience of having to show your identity card to enter a building after giving a blood sample essentially to get in, um, i.e. the normalizing of a highly militarized state practice that makes itself invisible, but it is very visible in the day-to-day -day interactions of people, I mean that even when people are aware of it, when the institutional process reproduces it, the language always confronted may not easily be available. And in this prince, in this case, when the invitation to healing justice process or healing as a part of that comes up, sometimes it doesn't even make sense. Um, someone's like, how am I gonna go get a massage when I've got no food at home? Or if I take food as a volunteer, I'm considered to be doing corruption according to the new remits or organizational principles. So how do we think about the, the labor of redistribution may not always be met by the structure of institutions and the labor of um, the labor of being one to bring one's vulnerability. And so I wouldn't even say it's different stages of healing because how people understand healing is so wide and so varied and um, that it becomes too complex to use a development model or who's accessing what because people access different terms by which they engage that but let's say if it is this model or this invitation I may not be comfortable entering a space where I know that I'm going to be punished by my yes. 
All right, um, seems like the is freezing a bit. We'll give her um, a few seconds. Danai? All right. Sometimes we get internet challenges. Um, that's common with um, the world in which we are now. Danai, can you hear us? I can. Sorry, I was. I thought I was with you. Next. We lost you at that point where you were talking about <laughs> um, the diverse understandings of healing uh, and coming to healing with that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, I guess I was trying to in indicate that it, it's because there was such a large range of understandings of what healing may mean or look like or appear, um, whether it's in the body manifest in the body's own sickness, for example, or um, or literally could be like, I need food on my table. <laughs> um, that, that it's difficult to stage a hierarchy, but I think the invitation to healing processes creates vulnerability because they also become part of a habit of performance management, for example, um, where how am I going to bring myself fully when I may face punishment? Sometimes simply creating an opinion of, or perspective that um, that that is in contradiction to the dominant idiom of what political action looks like within a certain movement. Um, and I think that shows up in various ways. So then I stayed with that political to move to the question of language or you know, particularly what healing justice may then mean in further conversation. If we go to the next slide. And in particular, um, recently the passing of, uh, of, a, of a comrade and activist and the manner by which it showed up um, in terms of how in terms of how her life was engaged and her person was engaged um, in, in that took up an idiom that is very productive and useful, which is the one of you know before the performance of the continuous the, the kind of the vulnerability of an approximate harm and to death in multiple at multiple levels and and around which ritualizing death or racializing mourning those who are unmournable is one idiom that crosses many sectors of um of political action or activism here i'm using an image because of where i'm located at this kind of context uh, made by a student collective that performs um sort of the turning away of the person who can't be admitted to university which promises you access but really doesn't because it's you know <laughs> it doesn't but but even in the kind of visual language of action often uses memorializing those who are mourned. And so we see this die-ins, for example, by black lesbians and many other ways of the funeral, for instance, um, was a moment to both build consciousness in, you know, during anti-apartheid struggle, for instance, but also were sites of intense militarized violence. So um, Zabalazo, um, kind of calling to the ancestors, for instance, um, it's the beating, it's the drums, it's the, it's the, it's the, but it's, it's the doom that like, that is part of that idiom of protest and an idiom within a language of, of what does it mean to engage with mourning those who can't be mourned because of these continuous systemic forms. And, but also by hailing ancestral, <laughs> that, that it's the, the drum itself, the call, the song itself, for instance, um, I'm in Solomon House, they just covered up the painting of his face, so much language house, but just even hailing those who are mourned um, as something that amplifies a consciousness and a consciousness of the self that is multiple across conditions of living and death. <laughs> that same term and that same idiom of practice in terms of what a die-in does that appears in different political movements. Can, another term came up around questions of language, what healing justice could be in Buselelo, which, um, English is failing me. Revival, so like church revival, for instance, is one practice. So I'm saying there's different understandings of what healing justice may look like depending on one's orientation. But you know, um, so someone speaking about their, their mother 
you know, actually several people speaking, you know, my mother goes to church and they do the all night revival and there's almost a somatic release. You pray and you sing your body literally, you know, the kind of somatic release of shaking the body that most of us unlearn as we become adults. Um, that, but that in that singing and that prayer and that also um, hailing of between life and death and, and spirit, that that release, that relief, it implies something that's within the same idiom of you know, a die and, and yet it, it, it has a different capacity or sensibility as related to the person um, that's in the language of things that both allow a sense of who the person is, but also slip out of the normal language of the political and the normal idioms because they have all these other attachments. And so I have survival at the top, um, you know, as a you know, the condition of a cycle. Um, that often political action is with intention to an audience, legible to different audiences. Some people will get some part of it, some people will miss all of it, but that there are multiple points of entry into audience that allows us to understand who and how power operates, what intention actions may be, what politics may look like, because it may be many, 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 many levels, depending on if you're inside or outside of those practices. Um, but in part, what I witnessed in seeing the celebration of this comrade was, the fullness of her person, the person as an interior life that splintered apart the confines of what a political sub activist subject may look like in a normative sense, because it undid ongoing kinds of practices that would have emphasized that not her as a person, <laughs> but her, her action and her death as political for a larger sense of movement space and building. And I think in here is so it's not to make an opposition that's false and that's why i'm saying it's not a false opposition but i think the coming up and the rising of a language that intentionally understands that the joyful engagement with and the beauty of engaging with ourselves as humans in the fullest capacity terrible and wonderful and beautiful and compassionate and unethical and but also just a person before and after and during their action as a comrade is also invested in these ritual forms and practices. And I think is a further extension of what I think said before was people have multiple hyphens of their positions, but also that particularly as African and black and people in the world, there's often an, a naturalized absenting of the fact that we have an interior life at all that I think is really at the heart of what it means to engage in healing. And I finish. thank you very much. Thank you so much, Denai, for, you know, giving us the nuances of the context in which you interviewed, that was South Africa, but also broadening it to, you know, the whole um, African peoples, if I may say, um, the issue on the politics of hierarchy, of being, of existence, and linking it to the issue of the politics of healing, uh, the differences in how we see and understand healing that are actually underpinned on the uh, context, the values within the context in which we live and the uh, rituals and practices and, and all those different nuances that are important for us uh, to pick, which goes back to the point of healing and healing justice is contextual. And that was the whole beginning point of this research uh, to contextualize it through the context to begin to contextualize it to the context. And as we can see from the presentations, uh, a lot more exists to be done. Thank you so much, uh, Denai. Uh, Olga, I hope you're back on. Uh, in the meantime, please post your comments, questions from the audience in the Q&A yeah, chat. Uh -huh. All right, over to you, Olga. Uh, before you start, Olga, I just want to let people know who you are. She's a feminist Congolese researcher, a sociologist, and activist with extensive experience in issues pertaining to gender-based violence, especially in context of political upheaval, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and gender equality. She has supported organizations in implementing humanitarian projects from a feminist perspective in the DRC, and the provision of psychosocial support to women in context of political unrest. Um, she's based, uh, she's, her studies are based in the University of Kinshasa, 
and is currently pursuing a master's. She heads the sociology development department at the University of Kinshasa. Over to you, Olga. Merci beaucoup, merci Kamate. Merci beaucoup, merci Kamate. Merci Jean pour la parole. Et nous, dans notre contexte, nous allons plus parler de violence sexuelle comme arme de guerre. Donc, dans les contextes des conflits en RDC, vous savez que euh, ça fait une, presque deux décennies et demie que la République démocratique du Congo a, a survécu par euh, cette guerre d'agression. Et à travers cette guerre d'agression, il y a plusieurs euh, des, des, des violences, il y a plusieurs de violences de, de, de toutes formes, comme violences sexuelles, psychologiques, physiques, etc., qui vraiment qui a l'ampleur dans ces contextes. Et nous avions mené cette recherche dans plusieurs provinces de la République démocratique du Congo et nous avions mis accent sur l'est de la République démocratique du Congo. Donc, c'est là où nous avions mis l'accent sur base de, de cette violence qui, 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 qui est perpétrée à chaque moment euh, auprès des femmes, auprès des filles et auprès des, des, des activistes, donc des de défenseurs des droits humains, droits de femmes dans cette partie de l'Est de la République. Et de là, nous avions constaté que la guerre, qui est le, le conflit armé, est, est à la base de traumatismes intergénérationnels que les femmes, les, les femmes, les enfants, ainsi que d'autres personnes euh, vivent dans ces contextes. Et on a trouvé que ces, ces traumatismes-là, intergénérationnels, les défenseurs aussi ne sont pas épargnés. Elles aussi euh, souffrent de traumatismes suite à, à cette guerre d'agression. Elles n'ont pas le temps de... Elles n'ont pas... Un terrain, le terrain n'est pas, le terrain n'est pas bon, le terrain n'est pas bon pour exercer leur métier parce que quand elles font euh, les activités et elles sont toujours menacées, elles sont toujours poursuivies, elles sont toujours euh, matraquées et du côté de la communauté, du côté personnel et du côté de l'autorité. Et là, nous voyons la, les, les structures, les autorités politico. Euh, les, les, les autorités politico-administratives. Ces activistes ou militantes qui cherchent à, à défendre les femmes, qui cherchent à parler des problèmes qui se passent, c'est elles qui sont aussi traumatisées suite aux actions qu'elles mènent. Et si nous voyons ces traumatismes, ils reviennent souvent dans le, les actions de. reviennent souvent dans nos cultures. Les normes sociales, parce qu'on dit que euh, la femme ne peut pas parler devant les hommes, la femme ne peut pas mettre la tête, pourquoi celle-là veut défendre une autre femme Et selon la culture africaine, et particulièrement la culture congolaise, euh, c'est des trop pour la femme. Et comme on trouve ça, c'est du trop, et cette femme subit des répressions des représailles de la, place, de, de la part de, de, de cette communauté qui ne veulent pas voir cette femme en train de défendre les autres. Et c'est comme ça qu'il y a des de, de traumatismes. Et ce traumatisme est intergénérationnel. Vous allez voir que la, la, la première catégorie de, de, des activistes et femmes qui ont subi ces, 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 ces traumatismes et la, 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 catégorie, la, la génération qui suit continue à subir le même traumatisme. Et si nous allons même dans des familles, dans les contextes vraiment de la population, de la communauté congolaise de l'Est, vous allez trouver qu'il y a des enfants qui sont nés dans les conflits, qui grandissent dans les conflits et qui mettent au monde dans les conflits. Et ces traumatismes-là qu'ils avaient lorsqu'ils étaient nés, ces traumatismes 
poursuit le cursus, lorsqu'il a grandi, il est toujours dans les traumas et il va aussi commencer à mettre au monde et il est toujours dans les traumas. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment euh, un traumatisme intergénérationnel qui, qui euh, affecte les femmes, qui affecte le, les activistes dans leur métier et qui affecte aussi la population. Et vous allez voir maintenant dans le cadre de, de la guérison euh, collective, vous allez trouver que ces femmes-là qui cherchent à, à, à défendre les autres, elles-mêmes, elles sont traumatisées aussi suite aux récits vécus par les autres femmes, suite aux expériences vécues, soit dans leur famille, ou suite aux expériences vécues dans la communauté, et suite aux expériences vécues dans leur métier. Et vous allez trouver que elles vont chercher maintenant les voies de sortie. Comment elle peut aller à chercher à comment elle peut chercher la guérison, comment elle peut chercher le bien-être de eux-mêmes parce que si la, la santé mentale est affectée, c'est difficile de prendre en charge une autre personne. Et nous avons trouvé que pour que ces femmes soient normales selon leur expérience et les, 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 la recherche sur le terrain. Les femmes ont déclaré qu'eux-mêmes se retrouvent dans les traumatismes après avoir aidé d'autres femmes ou bien écouté d'autres femmes. Et quand elles écoutent d'autres femmes, elles se mettent dans la peau de, de ces femmes et elles deviennent plus traumatisées. Elles deviennent plus traumatisées. Et à devenir traumatisées, elles-mêmes cherchent de voies de sortie. Et comment elles font pour qu'il y ait un bien, comment elles font pour qu'il y ait le bien-être de leur santé mentale. Selon les expériences, il y a les unes qui font de, des sorties récréatives, ils quittent l'endroit où ils vivent habituellement pour aller ailleurs et là, ils vont utiliser la musicothérapie, ils vont utiliser, euh, ils vont utiliser la musicothérapie, ils vont utiliser euh, ils vont utiliser la musicothérapie, la danse pour se sentir mieux. Et pour se sentir mieux. Alors, nous avions dit de parler aussi en paix de ces effets de traumatisme transgénérationnel sur les espaces d'activisme. Nous avons dit que les activistes féminines ont dû avoir les sentiments qu'elles n'essayent même pas à faire face suite à leur traumatisme. Il y a l'histoire de la violence qu'ils ont vécue au niveau de la famille, au niveau des, des tierces, alourdissent même d'autres femmes féministes à continuer ou à faire des activités qui étaient, les, 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 à poursuivre les, les, les activités de leur métier. Il y a aussi le blessure intérieur. Par exemple, vous allez voir, il y a la femme. Une femme qui est mariée, qui est activiste, des militantes qui sont mariées, activistes, qui vont aller défendre d'autres femmes. Mais dans cet espace-là, elles sont stigmatisées, elles sont rejetées, elles ne sont pas prises en considération, tout simplement parce qu'elles sont femmes. Et dans, ces, dans cet espace-là, pour chercher à donner une réponse en rapport avec, le, avec, en rapport avec leur métier, vous allez trouver qu'elles sont vraiment rejetées. Et c'est là que suscite la colère, la frustration, la peur, la douleur de s'exprimer. Souvent, elles ne savent pas, elles ne savent pas se, 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 se s'ouvrir. Elles ne savent pas s'ouvrir à d'autres femmes, à, ou à d'autres personnes, à d'autres militantes qui viennent, par exemple, pour chercher à secourir. Et cela amène à penser à des problèmes qui sont chez les autres militantes. Il s'agit des structures de mal qui ont marqué notre psychique et des manières dont nous, nous rapportons les uns les autres. Donc, vous allez trouver que dans cet espace-là d'activistes, il y a d'autres femmes, quand elles essayent, de, d'autres militantes, lorsqu'elles essayent d'expliquer, de parler ou de soutenir euh, euh, une cause réelle suite à des violences sexuelles et vous allez trouver que les bourreaux de ces violences ont de la force, ils ont des moyens et pour chercher à faire taire 
la militante qui veut défendre une cause qui est valable. Et souvent, la cause de la victime est rejetée à son propre sort. Il n'y a, a presque pas d'appui, il n'y a presque pas une prise en charge holistique pour cette victime, ni non plus aussi une prise en charge pour la militante qui veut défendre et dépouvée de moyens, manque de, 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 de financement, elle ne sait pas continuer à plaider pour les autres femmes. Et c'est ça qui font que les, plusieurs femmes cherchent à baisser la main pour continuer avec, cette, avec, avec, avec euh, le militantisme. Mais il y a d'autres femmes, il y a d'autres euh, activistes qui persistent dans ces contextes de conflit et qui sont là et qui continuent à mener, euh, à, mener c est, c est, c est, c est, à, à continuer avec son métier et à soutenir les femmes malgré les, 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 les pressions, malgré euh, le, le torture, malgré de menaces de mort, malgré de menaces. Et les femmes là, euh, cherche à All right, Olga, you have two minutes to summarize um, the rest of the à, points. À, à soutenir. Ok. Donc, ok. Donc, euh, ce que nous pouvons dire d'une façon euh, générale, les, nos, les entretiens que nous avons faits ont, ont souligné que la fourniture des réparations est essentielle pour obtenir la justice. Pas étonnant étant donné n'importe du récit de réparation dans la situation de conflit. La compréhension sexuelle spécifique, quand il y a l'inégalité des sexes, il y a l'injustice sociale, il y a la discrimination, il y a la résistance, il y a la violence structurelle, qui font que cet activiste n'ait pas l'accès ou n'ait pas la compréhension au sein de son propre milieu ou de son propre espace de travail. Et il y a aussi la justice de guérison qui est destruction. Et ces derniers termes semblent des souvenirs des exemples de violences sexuelles qui laissent les militants et les militantes détruites. Il n'y a pas une réparation, il n'y a pas une justice. On, on, on met plus l'accent sur la pénalité, mais on ne voit, plus, on ne voit pas euh, l'aspect de la victime. Comment on, peut faire une, comment on peut faire une réparation suite à ce que la victime a vécu. Et par rapport à la guérison, il y a plusieurs aspects, plusieurs formes de la guérison. Il y a la guérison collective, la guérison individuelle, qui sont mises dans plusieurs méthodologies traditionnelles, mais qui n'est pas classique. Par exemple, les femmes qui vont hors de la ville pour chercher à se faire traiter, les femmes qui font de partage d'expériences de, de, de traumatisme vécu dans le cercle où chacun donne une expérience qui donne une guérison à une autre, à une autre euh, activiste. Il y a aussi ceux qui vont visiter même de, 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 de la spiritualité avec les, les, la fumée, avec les incartations spirituelles qui donnent l'apaisement de l'esprit et qui donnent la, la satisfaction corporelle pour que la personne se sente mieux. Et il y a aussi, il y a aussi euh, la, la guérison, euh, la méthode comme euh, la danse, la musique, qui donne aussi, qui cherche à amener euh, cet activiste de, de se sentir mieux, de se dépasser de la situation euh, vécue, de se dépasser de ses traumatismes. Mais cela ne suffit pas. Il faut un modèle classique qui pourrait aider les activistes féminines surtout ici à l'est du Congo, un modèle classique qui va les aider à aller de l'avant et à chercher cette guérison collective ou individuelle dans ce contexte de traumatisme lié aux violences. Je dis et je vous remercie. Thank you, thank you so much, Olga. Thank you for bringing the context of DRC um, rooted in conflict and uh, sexual violence as the um, intergenerational and collective trauma that activists and defenders and women are experiencing and some of the pathways to a collective healing that were surfaced uh, from the research. 
would like to now turn it over to participants. Sorry, to Ablavi. Yes, Ablavi is a participant as well. To Ablavi to take us through, if we are saying that structural violence and intergenerational trauma affects defenders and activism and movements in those ways that have been outlined and that healing, um, that to transform this moment that we are in to transform movement building, to transform activism, we do need to center healing and pathways to healing as part and parcel of activism, looking at healing as politicized, looking at healing as transformational, as collective, as whole, as a process and contextual from the different discussions we've had from Danai and from Olga, we can see that, you know, while those are the two main branches of the framework, there are a lot of contextual nuances, but in my opinion, they also are still rooted in the same issues of the hierarchies of, of uh, the politics of hierarchy, the politics of location, the politics of language, the nuances in values of culture and context, the nuances in uh, different experiences. For example, while in DRC, it is um, the issue of conflict and sexual violence and conflict that's intergenerational, by the way, not just starting now, but you know, bed rocked on colonialism and the impact of colonialism. Similarly, in, in from um, the nice sharing uh, rooted in the systems of apartheid and what that does to the personhood. Um, we then move to Ablavi, who is going to share with us what then are the practical ways in which we are intending to transform the nature and practices of feminist organizing. What is the festival, is the Feminist Republic uh, under the auspices of Agent Action Plan Africa putting forward as part of experiential learning uh, from this research. Ablavi is my colleague. She's the Feminist Republic Culture Curator. Uh, she's born in Togo and is a, describes herself as a world citizen. She has had opportunity to travel and live in several countries. That's why she considers herself a world citizen. Uh, she has a master's in international and European laws from France. Um, she has more than 10 years of experience in international development and human rights issues, working with various organizations and is a feminist activist uh, based in Togo, as I say. Uh, over to you, Ablavi. Thank you so much, Jean, for this nice introduction. Um, I'm going to look at how the Feminist Republic, which is a special project by Urgent Action Fund Africa, is transforming the way in which feminist organizing is supported on the continent. The Feminist Republic is also known as the African Women Human Rights Defenders Platform and was established by Urgent Action Africa because defenders expressed the need to have a space where they will come together build community, support each other, reflect on the ways women's rights organizations and feminist movements are organizing across the continent and manifest dreams of transformation, justice, and healing within the movement and in our collective spaces. So in this regard, the Feminist Republic is inspiring the movement into building a transnational feminist solidarity that rallies around promoting and fostering cultures of care. We are encouraging and supporting the Pan-African feminist movement growth and resilience through centering cultures of care and healing in their actions and work. This is our common mandate within the Feminist Republic. And the Feminist Republic support towards a radical feminist organizing, meaning the centering of, cult meaning centering cultures of care and healing in the movement is demonstrated through various strategies. The first one is through shared leadership, collaboration, co-creation with feminists and activists. We know and we recognize the collective wisdom of defenders in finding solutions to their care and protection need. So all our work is led and always informed by defenders. Working closely with African women's human rights defenders who are building and maintaining, maintaining sorry, partnerships enables the Feminist Republic to truly embody inclusion, to listen 
and respect the perspective with regard to the safety, well-being, and resilience. Shared leadership and co-creation emphasizes African women's human rights defenders' voice and agency, and we respect that they know best what to prioritize in the holistic healing journeys. We do so by co-creating virtual and in-person platforms and spaces for defenders, partners, friends to come together, engage and explore with different aspects of healing justice and cultures of care. The second way in which the Feminist Republic is pushing for a healthier transformation within the movement is by the production of knowledge to ensure deep learning, memory, and inform and influence work. Communal practices, community-based practices are not something new and defenders and previous generations of feminists and women's human rights uh, defenders have practiced collective care throughout their lives. Practices that have often been erased by history, religion, and other aspects that we saw in the research. The Feminist Republic's ambition is to highlight these practices, document, amplify the knowledge, and inspire defenders and partners to discover, rediscover with different ways in which they can center collective care and healing justice in their lives and movements. The Feminist Republic platform also works to ensure that all the materials, all the documentation produced, and all the intelligence that we gather through the various partnerships with defenders are accessible, creative, and inspiring, knowing that the constituencies we serve come from all walks of life with different perspective and understanding of what healing justice entails and what it means to integrate collective care and healing justice in the organizing. We are generating a wide and diverse knowledge production reflecting the different African indigenous ways on issues around collective care and healing justice. And lastly, another way in which the Feminist Republic platform is supporting feminist organizing through a healing justice lens is by investing financially and technically in collective care and healing justice projects in order to accelerate the transformation, in order to boost the shift in movement culture. We recognize that for systemic change, it is necessary to work on changing the attitudes and norms that govern how we live and how we work together. We support Defenders Initiative to support, to start or revive the strengthening of their, of their organizations, networks, and movements through healing justice projects across the continent. The Feminist Republic, second slide please, Anneli. The Feminist Republic has a political mandate to promote and push for a radical practice of care and protection in the hope of changing the current operating culture within the movement. And the healing justice analysis has expanded on much of the articulations of why and how the feminist republic exists. Through examining intergenerational traumas and systems of oppression and the ways these are manifested in activist and movement lives and work, we begin to see the necessity to interrupt these harmful and toxic aspect of the current cultures and the need to position radical care and healing at the center of feminist organizing. So the Feminist Republic intends to keep on improving the cultures uh, and practices of feminist organizing and supporting African women human rights defenders to take the healing justice analysis further through various actions and strategies. First of all, we intend to popularize the framework of healing justice by talking about it uh, in our virtual or in-person gatherings and convenings with defenders and partners. 
For example, end of last year, we hosted the second edition of the Feminist Republic Festival in Kenya, which gathered more than 500 activists, founders, healer, academics from the continent and even from all the other countries all around the world. And we gave uh, that festival gave us an opportunity to launch and give another view of the healing justice research and its findings. So to all of the participants, and we also printed uh, hot copies in French and English that we that were distributed to all of them. And the electronic version is also available on our various social media platforms. By doing so, we would like defenders, partners, and friends to familiarize themselves with the concept of healing justice, to engage in deep, sometimes difficult, but necessary conversations around the current operating culture within the movement, and to look together for solutions that will allow us all to begin our collective healing journeys. Secondly, noting the critical importance of documentation in our knowledge production, we will be embarking on diverse projects to generate popular education tools that present the findings and insights from the research and reflections from defenders on the healing justice framework. We want these knowledge production pieces to be bold, innovative, so the ideas are more practical, relatable, and accessible to more defenders to engage with. Uh, as an example, we intend to partner with artists, uh, artists who are also activists, to develop creative pieces inspired by the healing justice research and its ripple effect in the defenders' life and movements organizing. Also, we will be supporting defenders in their initiatives to develop and engage in partnerships and campaign with healers and practitioners that challenge the current operating culture within the movement and the dominant approaches to healing and health. That way, healers and practitioners can share, can directly share the knowledge and offer practical support to activists through traditional healing practices. And finally, we will be co-creating and supporting spaces with activists where healing will play a central role, where healers and practitioners will be an integral part of the movement organi organizing. Activists will be able to discover, explore, and experiment African, indigenous, traditional healing practices in all its diversity. So overall, this is what the Feminist Republic works entails and how we are planning to take the healing justice analysis further in order to achieve our core mandates of building and strengthening the feminist movement across the continent through the integration of cultures of care and healing justice in their lives in activism work. That's it for me. Thank you for your attention. Merci, merci beaucoup, Ablavi. Thank you so much, Ablavi, um, for outlining practical steps that we are taking as a result of this research. I'll just add to that that in centering collective care and healing, we are investing in infrastructure for that a space for African women human rights defenders, a space owned and co-created by African women human rights defenders to find respite, rejuvenation, healing, engage in cultural memory, uh, write our histories, engage in unpacking intergenerational trauma and structural violence, strategize, mobilize, and that is a healing farm that's based uh, in Kenya in Kitui County. Uh, it is a space, it is part of our politicized project to shift cultures of care and healing, and it will be a space where we can physically continue engaging uh, with these issues, um, you know, 24 hours, 365 days um, a year, uh, so that African women stop um, experiencing collective care and healing as one-offs in workshops, but have a space where they can go in depth in order to diffuse that into the organizing and, and the mobilizing of the work. And that's our offering um, as part of politicizing healing.
healing and transforming uh, feminist activism and movement building. So thank you very much, uh, all our panelists. It's over to you again, the participants with questions and comments. Some have surfaced and I'll, I'll read those out um, while the rest of you can type any comments and questions you have, and then we'll hand it over to each of the speakers to go through uh, their thoughts on in general, the discussions that we've had and the questions and comments that have surfaced and their last closing um, words. So we have Betty Sharon, uh, who is one of our partners, um, commenting on development of the healing justice tool should also target the environmental healing, especially where perpetrators are known by survivors. Uh, so that will be discussed. Um, but as well as, as tagging to the broad environment um, that's beyond um, perpetrators uh, and you know the whole ecosystem that we are in. Isa too has many comments, um, is definitely passionate about healing justice and engaging in healing justice in different ways. I'll pick highlights from their comments. Um, in a system and society that actively targets black, brown and indigenous bodies with violence, oppression and terror, it's critical to build movements that fight for and achieve justice for all people. This justice includes healing, well-being, and not only surviving and thriving, exactly. That's the point of the whole research. Resilience and healing are strategic. And if I may add, they are urgent, critical components of sustaining our movements. We need everyone in our movements to have access to healing from trauma and violence as it strengthened all of us and all of our movements. Thank you so much, Isa too. Imagining a world through a healing justice framework means mental health experts de-escalating harmful situations instead of relying on police intervention. Yes, uh, Massa spoke to that. Way um, this manifests in the institutions that we have, including the health systems and the criminal justice systems. And again, she can add to that comment. Then a question <coughs> again from Isa too. Could methods of healing justice and Afrofuturist feminism offer guidance for designing tools that center joy and healing? And I'll add that also move us away from casserole uh, feminism and casserole feminist organizing. Um, again, the speakers will all comment to all those comments, will add their thoughts to those comments and their winding up thoughts. Um, then Danai added to the conversation teacher in inverted commas and researcher in inverted commas are not value neutral placements or positions uh, which operate within these cycles as well, going back to the politics of hierarchy uh, and where that places us within the um, spectrum of healing and transformation. Isa too, again, a healing justice and holistic security frame create space for learning and the development of new tools and modalities that meet current needs. And I will add that are critical to the context in which we are development of new tools and modalities. At the individual level, funding may support. Yeah, so there was a lot of comments around funding and the role of funding in supporting practices like meditation, mindfulness, somatic practices, um, as well as funding networks of healing, funding transformative justice and conflict resolution, mediation. And I think these comments are pointing to the gaps within the funding ecosystem around supporting collective care and healing justice, the focus that should be put on those uh, funding, those issues and the ideological shifts needed for us to realize funding that is holistic um, in building and sustaining movements and not looking at movements as just tools and mechanism, but centering the people within these movements and their sustainability and their well being. So I'll pass it over to the speakers and we'll move in this order. We'll start with you, Masa, then we'll move to Jackie, um, we'll move to Danai, we'll move to Olga, and then we'll go to Ablavi. There are comments that have surfaced in the second round of questions and answers, but there are also the general discussion that has um, that we've had discussions from your fellow panelists, but also earlier questions and comments. Could you, each of you, you know, give a wrap up 
speaking to the questions and comments, but also giving your final uh, wrap up, final takeaways as we close this discussion and then move on to expanding um, the understanding and the centering of healing justice as a radical movement building strategy. So starting with you, Masa, then we'll move to Jackie. Um, great. So, so I, I, I really, I really love that the presentations, but also the comments and questions really, um, are, are highlighting the ways in which, um, this is a framework that really aims at transformation. <laughs> and, and that is really at the heart of what, um, of what the, 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 the research is, um, um, what's kind of the grand conclu conclusion, so to say, is that um, there there was a there was a quote that um, that healing um, is really a revolutionary process as seen by activists. That would a quote was that it resets organizational templates, and by doing that, it would usher in a new reality. <clears throat> um, and my kind of my feedback to the comments um or or what i think really the comments really highlight is that um this is really long-term work that would um that necessarily entails a lot of difficult conversations um starting from um the ways in which feminist spaces can be transformed which was a dream that I would say all of the activists interviewed kept coming back to and really politicizing what it would mean to ritualize healing in our spaces. Um, so discussing woundedness that brings us into activism spaces, questioning a lot of the, you know, terms that are um that are used in many spaces like safe space and the ways in which um and the ways in which um, the repetition of using safe space was highlighted in interviews as actually a way to stop difficult conversations from happening. Um, and so, and so, yes, I, 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 I kind of I resonate with with what I'm. I think the essence that I'm hearing from from comments that um, that this is deep, long term work, and that it would require. Um, a shift in the mindset of donors and funders as well, which is also a really critical um, point that the research highlights um, that we cannot, for instance, keep funding or supporting conversations around the closure of civic space without really interrogating the root of why is it that space keeps closing and it closes and that that experience of closure um, really varies um, between activists um, and kind of bringing that nuance is is missing. Um, so there was a lot of there were a lot of recommendations on supporting um, conversations that really aim at tackling the root of why is it that we experience reality in the way that we do. Um, and um and 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 also the the ways in which um the ways in which again that would mean that feminist spaces are ready for the difficult conversations that need to happen um because in order for that conversation on the structural roots to to make sense, it would also need to be combined with an analysis of power and how it plays out in feminist um, organizing spaces. Um, so, so yeah, I think that was that's my concluding. Um, these are my concluding remarks and also my reflections on um, what I what I'm what I'm hearing as this theme running through the the, the, the comments that this is. Um, really long-term, deep, difficult to work, but that the time for it um, really, really is now. 
Thanks. That time is now. Thank you so much, Masa. I wouldn't say it any better. That time is now. It's long term, it's deep, but it's transformative and it's what we need right now as a world. Over to you, Jackie. Okay, I'm going to be brief because we're um, coming up to the end of our time. But just to say that I really appreciate all the questions, really pertinent questions and contributions from everyone attending um, this event, as well as um, all the speakers. I guess in wrap up, I think that in, in prioritizing as part of movement work, the tackling of the impacts of trauma and injustice as they manifest in everyday realities, um, and organizational dynamics. Um, healing justice is really exciting in terms of um, having the potential to work towards more sustainable feminist organizing and ultimately stronger movements. We have, as we've said, what is done, what's actually done has to be contextualized. That that's, was our starting position, but also that it's necessary for a systems response to this, um, that, that this kind of work to be achieve what we want it to achieve requires institutional and organizational structures to change and feminist financing to change. And of course, I think it's really exciting what UAF Africa and the Feminist Republic are doing in this regard and uh yes <laughs> to echo the time is now it's it's great that it's happening thank you thank you i think the time is now is going to be a slogan from this um seminar Lanai, over to you yes thank you i'll be really brief um, I was thinking about the environment of healing um, in several ways, particularly in the, with the reference was perpetrators, but also other modes of living and surviving came up too, um, i.e. to, you know, how we grow food, how we engage with the world in ways that are rooted in things that are generationally inherited, but become out of practice that give a different mode of the general idioms or practice of activism, i.e. the environment, not just because there's money in climate change and everybody jumps on things that are new and fancy, but that actually there's a relation to the self that is beyond the kind of capacity of humans and what we understand that is generationally inherited related to land, but also the practice of being with one another. But also relating to the question of perpetrators, it also came up a lot in terms of as related to burnout, even in discussion between activists and across people, even as it relates to dealing with hierarchical contestation. Part of the burnout is also that we live in, a, in the context of call out culture, which almost mislodges the context of dialogue, whether within organizations and outside and around it, um, because while strategically at times it's been useful, the kind of turn to it and the fear environment it does create um, between a victim and a perpetrator, <laughs> you know, it becomes um, has become so easily and legibly useful, it's almost unthought. And so what it does then mean, people talked a lot about um, their own capacity to, again, not only be vulnerable to conversations, but to recognize that to bring something up means you are investing yourself to become subject to being used or usable for a movement and not being a person, but also subjecting yourself to a way that your own personhood is diminished to what operates outside and around of you, as well as it relates to another person. So it came up several times that people often even leaving organizations and movements is not because the fear of their perpetrator. Some people also talked about even within organizations where the intention was to look for and find accountable perpetrators and people they were dealing with didn't were not using that same logic or vernacular of a sense of justice. So justice itself was a critical term. Well, who's justice and under what terms and who operates and who is allowed to condition their meaning and understanding of justice. And so because that we are filtered, we are breathing violence, that we are moving between categories of perpetration that are so multiple that people, that idea of even speaking to that set of notions, not that it's not valuable, strategic and important, but it was exhausting. It was also part of the burnout. People are just, I'd rather just leave than to invest myself in being usable for that dialogue. So I would add that final question in terms of I think that those terms 
are productive and useful, but also sometimes we use terms because they are legible, we understand what it means as though, but they can also become unthought. And in becoming unthought, then it's harder for people to use them with a true intention of the moment they're existing in, and so they withdraw. Thank you, Danai. So Olga and Ablavi, you have the unfortunate um, role of being last. So I'm going to ask you to shorten to one minute <laughs> your last reflections. Olga? Uh, merci, merci, Jim. Donc, uh, je pense que tout est, tout est dit. Comme vous m'avez donné une minute, la seule chose que nous devons mettre en application, euh, la justice réparatrice en Afrique. Et nous demandons à toutes les femmes, toutes les, toutes les activistes d'être debout, de persévérer et de voir comment trouver des voies et moyens pour que nous brandissons cette justice et que ça soit appliqué dans toutes nos actions que nous allons mener. Merci. Thank you so much, Olga. Merci, merci, merci. <laughs> Finally, Ablavi. I like your French, Jean. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And just to say that is, it was such an honor to take part in this research and to go deep into all this conversation and learn more about the these intergenerational traumas and the systems of oppression and especially learn the ways in which these are manifested in our lives and our work. This is a good start, and we hope that we'll be able to popularize the, the result of the research to make it more access accessible across the continent and even uh, somewhere else, so that it can be owned by the defenders so that healing justice is materialized in our lives and in our work. And of course, money is the key. So that's why we're also funding and pushing donors, funders for more funding towards all the initiative around healing justice and collective care. So that this is this is an integral part of our movement culture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I'm only just going to end with the anecdotes from or bylines from this discussion. The time is now, and really the time is now, we all can see it. Healing is revolutionary, urgent, and critical strategy that we need to center in the movement building and activism that we are doing to push back up against all the oppressive systems that are fostering the crisis that we are uh, experiencing. Without that, we are just continue running around in circles. Uh, please engage with us for more discussions. Uh, we're going to send this recording to all of you and everyone who registered. We had over 200 registrations and we are continuing these discussions. We are unpacking from the research and putting forward uh, learnings in different ways. You heard what Ablavi said. We also have a special journal series coming out. We have popular education materials. We are supporting organizations with grants to um, further this work. So it's not only a seminar, a research and a seminar, we're action oriented and we look forward to engaging more with you. Thank you so much, everyone who came. Thank you so much, all participants of the panel. And thank you so much, people who are giving us uh, support behind the scenes, Gary and Zanelli and our interpreters. Have a great day, everyone, wherever you're located. Bye and see you next time. <laughs>